Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about research software. I guess uh, first I'll just mention that even though um, we are uh, we're using social media, which is great. Um, we're using uh, old social media, and so if you want to join me in new social media, you could join Mastodon, and uh, and, and that's that, that's me over there. So. Okay. It's interesting. Ah, okay, this way. All right. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna try to give an introduction to research software in a little bit more detail, talking about kind of what research software is, um, why it's important, and some recent activities that have been going on to try to um, to try to bring a community together around it. And I will use that then to talk about uh, specific things that different elements of the community, different kinds of stakeholders, can do, including funders. So the first thing I think is just why we care about research software. And, um, and there's a few different ways that we can look at this. One of them is by looking at funders. Um, we could say that uh, about 20% of NSF projects over a multi-year period uh, discussed, uh, topically discussed software in their abstracts. Um, within the US Department of Energy, two of three uh, main areas of the Exascale computing program are really software areas. Um, in the National Institutes of Health, again in the US, uh, I could find $300 million of, uh, of funding for research software um, in one year. And one of, the, one of the challenges, actually, is that it's very hard to look at any funder and figure out what software they're funding. So these are um, probably low estimates um, at best. Uh, we can also look at publications. And we can see that, uh, that software-intensive projects really are a majority of current publications. And if we look at the most cited papers, they are almost all either software papers or methods papers. And, and you can really think of software papers as implementations of methods. Um, and we can actually then also ask researchers. And so if we ask researchers, which has been done in the US and the UK, um, we find that, uh, that, that they overwhelmingly use research software, that their, software, that their, uh, their research is dependent on that software, um, and that about half of them are actually developing software as part of their research. So if we think then kind of where software fits in the research cycle, and this is not uh, really a, uh, what most people's research looks like, but it's what you might um, learn in, in school is what research is supposed to look like. Um, and so I'll, I'll use this. Um, we, we start by creating a hypothesis. I'm, I'm not actually sure that I've ever created a hypothesis as part of my research in my life, but <laughs> in any case, this is what I'm told I'm supposed to do. Um, we, then, uh, we then acquire resources to try to investigate that hypothesis, and I guess this part actually isn't in the, in the school book version of this. We, the resources are just there, and you can investigate your hypothesis automatically, but in real life, you have to actually get resources. Um, you then actually do the research, and as, as you're doing this research, you're probably building software and, and creating data that's, that's part of this. Um, and then you want to share that, right? and so you want to publish your results. And those results might be a paper about the research, they might be a notebook that expresses the research, they might be the software that you developed or the data you developed. Um, and, and this is the, the knowledge then that you're really transitioning um, to the rest of the community about what you've done. And you then want to, uh, you want to do this again. Right? You want to, to use this to, to build, uh, to, to think about another hypothesis, maybe a better hypothesis or better software that you can build. Um, and in order to do that, you have to gain recognition because that's really the piece that enables you to, uh, to start the next, the next cycle and at least to gather the resources for the next cycle. Um, so software shows up here in a couple of different places. It shows up as part of the research and it also shows up as infrastructure, the things that go into the research from somebody else and the things that come out of the research to other people. Um, so we can think then about those two different pieces, that, that some research software is really developed as part of the research. If you ask a funder, um, they may or may not know that that software is being developed. It, it might be somewhere written in the proposal, but it's not really the highlight. It's the, the highlight is the scientific knowledge that's being gained. Um, this software then also may be, may be archived and it may be um, saved for reproducibility. Um, and it is almost certainly dependent on other software. Right? It, it's very unlikely that somebody is building software that just works by itself without any other software. And so that other software is the, is the infrastructure software, research infrastructure software. And that's, again, it's a dependency of most software, but it is also um, something that's intended to be shared from the beginning. And if funding has been acquired to build that, the funders are very, uh, are very clear that that is the purpose of that, of that funding. 
Um, it is, uh, it's intended for use by a community over a long period in many cases. Um, and we can also take software that's in that first category, research software, and turn it into research infrastructure software. But uh, the people that are doing this have to actually want to do this, and they have to have the incentives to, to do this. Um, it has to be something that they choose and that they get rewarded for. And there's consequences to them and to their careers that can be both positive and negative, and they have to decide if they want to do that. Do they want to, to live based on their, their research results, or do they want to live based on the software they've produced and the people who are using it? Uh, and different people give different answers. So one, one way of thinking about this is similar to any other product development, um, that when you are initially developing a product, um, you're really focused on that product itself. And over time, as the product becomes more mature, you move into a point where you're no longer really focused on the development of the product, but you're really focused on how the product is being used, um, on who you're transitioning the product to, who your users are, who your customers are, what they're doing, um, how do you support them. And so if you're, again, moving your software uh, from, from research that's supporting your own research to something that's going to support other people, you have to, to really change phases along this path. And, and so doing this, you have to make a series of different, uh, different choices. Right? You have to think about the, the methods and the goals and the consequences of, of making these choices. Um, you have to think about what resources are available to help. Are you in the Netherlands and you have the eScience Center potentially to, to help you with this? Or are you somewhere else where you don't actually have those resources? Or maybe you have something at your university. Um, what kind of work is going to be needed? Do you have the skills to do that work? Do you have professional staff that has those skills? Um, what are the incentives to do this? Is this something that you're going to be rewarded for in your career? Is your, uh, is your community going to appreciate this? Can you go to a conference and give a talk about this? Um, and how is success going to be measured? Um, and then finally, is the institution actually going to support this? Does, is this something that your institution cares about and it's going to help you in your case for promotion or the next time that you're asking for resources from your department chair? So, so this is, again, a decision that, that has to be made individually. Um, if, we, if we then think about this um, in, a, in a large sense and kind of step back a second and think about what research software really is, um, I'm going to use a, a couple of definitions that are from uh, this, this link down on the bottom. I guess I, I should have pointed out, as Michelle did, that there's a DOI at the bottom of these uh, slides, and so you can, you can get this, these slides and, and look at them yourself, and I think they'll be on the conference website, hopefully, as well. Um, so, so research software includes a, a bunch of different kinds of software, source code, algorithms, scripts, um, other things that were created during the research process or for research purpose. Um, there's also other software that's important in research that's not research software. Uh, things like operating systems, libraries, uh, dependencies, packages, scripts. Um, we are calling these um, software in research, but not research software. And the difference between these two things varies between disciplines. So just as an example of this, um, if you're a computational chemist, the compiler to you is probably software in research. It's not part of research software. Um, but if you're a computer scientist working on compilers, then the compiler actually is research software for you. So these are not hard and fast rules. They're, they're generalizations in some sense. So one of, the, one of the issues then that we have, and the reason that sustaining software is so important is software collapse. Um, and this is a term from Conrad and Hinson uh, that basically is a, a short way of saying that software does not last by itself. It will eventually stop working if it's not actively maintained by people. And so it's very different in, in some sense than, um, than, than hardware or than, than data even. Right? The, the data that you have is going to be the data that you have in the future. There may be issues about how it's stored, um, but there's not issues with about the content itself. But for software, there actually are issues about the content and can you, can you build it and can you actually use it. Um, the structure of computational science, in particular, or data science software stacks, um, has, has four levels. And the one at the bottom of this is the non-scientific infrastructure, uh, things that are not developed by a developer usually, that are developed by, uh, by, by uh, sorry, not developed by researchers, but developed by other developers, things like operating systems and, and again, compilers and, and libraries. Um, on top of this is the scientific infrastructure that sometimes researchers develop, uh, not always. Um, things like libraries and utilities that are used for research within research software itself. Uh, on top of this is discipline-specific software, things that are developed by a community of researchers, maybe some that specialize in, in the software. Um, things like tools and libraries that are implementing discipline-specific packages. 
And then finally on top of this is the project specific software that's developed almost always by an individual researcher who is working on solving one particular scientific problem. Um, and these could be things like applications, but they also could be things like scripts or workflows or, or other, again, high level uh, instantiations of, of a way of asking a research question and trying to answer it. Um, the key fact here is that the software in any level builds on and depends on the software in all the levels below it. And none of the software is static. And so when anything changes, everything above it likely has to change in order for the software to keep working. All right, so if your operating system changes, then you may have to reload your applications on your phone. If you're working in, in scientific computing, you may have to rebuild the, uh, the, the community application that you're working on, then you may have to rerun it with different inputs that you have as well. So if we think about research software then, um, we can think about the fact that, that the software is developed and used for the purpose of research um, in general, uh, often by researchers. Um, it's increasingly essential within this process, but there are problems here. Uh, one of them, again, as I just said, is that software collapses if it's not maintained. So we need to do that maintenance. Um, this could be the fact that software bugs are found within the software. Uh, it could be the fact that new features are needed. The, the, the world of, uh, of physics moves on and we need to include a, a new PDE within our model. Um, or it could be that there's a new platform that's arisen, right? We can't uh, depend on CPUs anymore, now we have to use GPUs and we have to start thinking about quantum computing or, or something else. So all of these things are leading to changes that are needed in software and old software that does not continue to work. We also then have the fact that this development maintenance is human intensive, right? We can't automate this. Somebody, some person actually has to do this and they have to be dedicated to doing this, they have to have incentives to do this, they have to have rewards for doing this. The software that we have in research is generally developed by researchers and it's specific to, to their research or to their communities. Um, these researchers know their disciplines incredibly well, but they don't always know software best practices. Um, and so there's a, an issue here in terms of, of training and education. Uh, we also then, as, as we've said before, have the issue that the, the researchers are not always rewarded for their software development and maintenance work, particularly in academia. Um, if they're in industry, they almost certainly are. If they're in national labs, they may be. Uh, if they're in universities, they probably aren't. They do it because they feel like it's important. They do it because they need to do it for their own research. Um, they do it because other people are depending on them, but they're not doing it necessarily because they're gonna get promoted based on this, although that's where we'd like to get to. We also then have the fact that the developers do not match the diversity of overall society. And so I don't know um, how much of this is an issue in any particular country in the US, this is certainly an issue. So if we think about software sustainability then as the way to try to address these things, I'm defining software sustainability as the fact that the software endures. And, and so the question that you could ask is, will the software continue to be available in the future on new platforms meeting new needs? Um, and you can only measure this in hindsight. You can't measure this going forward. You cannot say that software is sustainable. You can only say that software has been sustained. Right? We can do things that we will think will make the software sustainable, but we don't actually know until time passes and we find out. Um, again, software development and maintenance requires active human effort. This human effort is kind of like money, but it's not exactly like money. Um, we can have projects that are entirely based on human effort, and these can be community open source projects, and we know there's a lot of these and they work relatively well. We can have projects that are based entirely on money, on salary, um, and these are grant funded projects, for example, or projects working in industry, and these work quite well as well. Um, the thing that's much harder is actually when we try to do both of these at the same time, where we say that, um, where I say I have a grant to develop software and I'd like some other people to volunteer their time to help me with that project. Right? It, it's hard to make that case and to get people to volunteer where other people are getting paid. And so that's uh, a challenge that happens in a lot of uh, open source projects. So just to, to define this then um, as kind of the, maybe the, the, the kernel of this talk in some sense, we have the fact that, that research software sustainability is the process of developing and maintaining software that continues to meet its purpose over time, uh, including that it adds new capabilities as needed by its users, it responds to bugs and other problems that are developed, and it's ported to work on new versions uh, of the underlying layers, including software as well as hardware. So if we agree then that software sustainability is a problem, and I hope that even if you haven't thought about it exactly in this way, this is part of the reason you're here is that you recognize that there are problems that we need to solve, and we can hopefully do that together through this meeting. 
um, there's, there's a bunch of different solutions. Um, so if we want to do this, we can do one of, of three different kinds of things, in my opinion. Right, we can try to do things that reduce the amount of work that's needed to sustain the software. We can try to do things that increase the available resources that go into sustaining the software. Or we can do things that, that do both, that reduce the amount of work that's needed as well as increasing the resources. And I think that the, these solutions then can be implemented at different levels by different, uh, by different kinds of participants, different stakeholders. Um, there's what an individual project can do to, to reduce the amount of work that's needed to sustain that project or to bring in new resources for that project. There's what a community can do, there's what a funder can do, and there's what an institution can do. Again, thinking of an institution as the place that hires people to do this kind of work. Um, if we're thinking about this, this first piece where we want to reduce the amount of work that's needed, uh, we can think of a few different things, potentially. We can think of, of training developers, which means that we actually have to, to find or develop training material, and there has been work going on in, in this work, in this area, like the, the Carpentries, for example, has been doing this at a low level. Uh, Code Refinery has been doing this at the next level up. There are others that are also trying to do this and trying to disseminate this knowledge within the academic community. <coughs> Uh, we can think about best practices as well, right? So what are the best practices to make software sustainable or to actually sustain that software? Um, again, uh, Software Carpentry has been doing this, and, and then there's also incubators that have been doing this, like the, um, like the Apache Foundation, for example, but, but others as well. Um, if we want to think about the other side, about how we increase the available resources, we can think about creating incentives so that people want to work on the software. And this is probably one of the, one of the bigger ones that, uh, that's an area worth thinking of. Um, one way that we can do this is to use citations for the software with the idea that, that citations will help in existing career paths. And so with this, I want to just digress for a minute into some, some details on software citation um, and, and just provide some resources for, for people that are interested in learning more about software citation and what we've been doing in this area since uh, 2015. Um, we have, uh, in 2016, we published a set of software citation principles, as was mentioned earlier before. And the idea of these principles, then, is, is to say, kind of, where, where should software citations work? How should we, how should they work? Who needs to do something with them? Um, and, and the idea of principles by themselves is very nice, but they don't actually work without implementation, without a lot of work around them. And so since 2016, uh, it, it took us about 18 months to figure out what these principles were, and it's now taken us uh, six years so far, plus probably more time to try to figure out how do we implement these principles, how do we actually get people to carry them out. Um, and so things that we've done is to produce uh, guidance for paper authors who want to cite software, uh, for software developers who want to make their software citable, um, for best practices for software registries and for communities. Um, so uh, registries play a key part in citation because they're the place where the permanent identifiers come that need to be associated with the citations. Uh, we've been working with journals and conferences and we've just finished um, a, a string of work that was again over 18, 24 months uh, to provide guidance to journals about how they should tell their authors and their reviewers and their editors about software citation. Uh, and we provided this guidance in a very generic way so that different publishers and different journals could customize it using examples that are right for their communities and the right styles for their communities as well. Uh, because citation styles ends up being an important thing because we don't actually have uh, machine readable citations, we have human readable citations and, right, and, and everybody has a different style that they prefer or require. Um, so, so that's software citation. Um, the next thing then is to think about career paths. So we can think about adjusting existing career paths. So faculty, for example, how do we adjust career paths so that their software work is, is better rewarded? Um, but we can also think about new career paths. And so with this, I want to, to make a, a second slight digression and, and go into a little bit of details. Um, and specifically, I want to talk about research software engineers and work that's been, doing, that's been going on there. Um, th this term and, and this movement were born in the UK. Uh, in 2012, the UK RSC, uh, sorry, the uh, UK, yeah, the UK RSC Association was created with about 50 members with, um, with support and uh, encouragement from the Software Sustainability Institute from, from Neil. Um, this has now led to a uh, society of RSEs that when I checked last had about uh, 600 dues paying members and about 3,600 people in the overall community. Um, so, so lots of people that started um, 
agreeing with us, feeling like this represented them, and feeling like they wanted to be part of this community. Um, there are also uh, RSE uh, communities in, in Belgium, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in the Nordic countries, in Australia and New Zealand that are established communities with, uh, with a presence and regular meetings. Uh, and then there's also the, the institution in the U.S. that I've been involved with, the U.S. RSE, where we're currently at about uh, 1,400 members that we've gathered over uh, about three or four years now. Um, there are also new associations now forming, as, as Michelle was mentioning, in, uh, in Africa and in Asia. And there are also kind of uh, proto-associations or discussions of associations going on in other countries. Uh, Canada is, is one example where there's been a lot of discussions, but, but not quite the next step of the formal organization. Um, so I, I think we'll see more of these coming over time. Um, these associations then work on local issues. Uh, they can do this both. Uh, they can do this collectively uh, within their within their countries, within their regions, and they can help coordinate activities that are happening within those regions as well. And then there also is an international community where we've tried to bring these different organizations together. Sorry, one one more animation, and then you can take pictures. Um, okay. Um, so so this is a, a picture from Ian Costin, just showing where we have existing RSE organizations now. Um, and where in uh, lighter uh, pink we have um, organizations that are appearing. Um, and, and then in blue we have the areas where we still need to do work in the rest of the world. Um, and so if you happen to be from a, a country that's in, uh, that's in blue, um, uh, we'd be very happy to talk about how to, how to start an RSE organization and how to bring it into this international collection and international uh, coalition of, of other RSE organizations. Okay, so sorry, so back, uh, back where we were. Um, so again, talking about increasing the available resources for research software. Um, we can also try to make the role of the software in research clear to research funders, um, which hopefully you're already uh, okay with if you're here, um, and, and try to, to make the case to, to you, to them, um, to, to increase funding for new software and really more specifically to increase the funding of maintenance for existing software. Because again, as I was saying, Right, the software doesn't just stand by itself. You need to maintain it over time. And so if you as a funder are putting money into building new software, you have to recognize that there's also some commitment, some sustainability plan that's needed, whether that's funding from you, whether that's funding from somewhere else, whether that's volunteers, um, that's going to keep that software going over time or else you're basically just putting funding into something that's only gonna last a couple of years and is gonna go away which I don't think is the intention of, of much research software funding. Uh, you can also seek institutional resources. So just as an example of this, um, at NCSA, we have uh, two packages that we've been developing over uh, 15 years. And so we're putting some of our own funds into maintaining those packages as well. And, um, and this can happen in institutions. It doesn't probably happen as much as it should, but it is a, a valid path to go forward. Um, and then finally, if we're thinking about methods that can both reduce the work and uh, bring in new resources, the main thing to do is to encourage collaboration. Um, and so if you can get other people to collaborate with you, then that is less things that you need to do yourself. Um, and you can depend on the work of those others as well. Uh, you don't have to build all the software. They can build some of it for you, uh, or you can use their work in some of your software. Um, if those others... Um, Oh, sorry, let me skip that for a second. Uh, but uh, so if we want to make this work, if we want to collaborate in software, it's important to think of that software as generally as possible to begin with. Right? You can't think about you're going to build software just to solve your problem. You have to think about how do you build software that solves your problem, but it's also hopefully going to solve somebody else's problem. Right? Maybe some pieces of your software can be pulled out. Maybe you have internal APIs you can expose. Um, maybe you are building your software in a modular way. Maybe you're building it as a library. Um, so, so thinking about those different issues. Um, and then you actually have to do work to make this happen. You can't just build software and put it on GitHub and assume that somebody is going to, to get it and use it. Right? You have to go out and talk to people. Uh, you have to find people that are, that are just starting to build the uh, 350th workflow system and say, well, we have these other 350. Maybe you could use one of those instead. Um, all right, that doesn't necessarily happen very often, but, uh, but that's the, that is the goal, is to, is to talk about software and to try to get people to use existing software to, to maintain software, to add to existing software, and not to build new software. 
Okay, um, and then uh, finally is making the software actually findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable as part of this engagement of the community. And so then one, one quick digression on this. Um, so we have in the last uh, two years built a set of FAIR principles for research software. We, we had the initial FAIR principles um, that had the idea of applying to all kinds of research objects, but in practice really applied to data and were really hard to use for other research objects. Um, in fact, the, the text of the principles themselves implied data very strongly in them. It, it didn't say research objects, it said data. Uh, so, so we have the fact that, that software is, is kind of data. You can represent it as data, but it's not just data. And if you think about it just as data, then you end up losing out on, on the properties of the software itself. Um, so when we actually go into this and, and did this work to build FAIR principles, we discovered that the, the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, the ideas are mostly the same. Um, but the details of how they're actually implemented depend on um, how these different kinds of objects, these software, these data, these other things are actually created and, and used, um, how and where they're stored and shared, and uh, where and how the metadata is stored and shared. And these are all different for software than they are for data. And this is what leads to the differences in the principles. So this gave us then a path about work that we could do to define and implement and adopt principles. And we've published these principles uh, a few months ago. Um, in, this, in this paper, and then we've been doing a little bit more publication around them recently. Uh, so again, a uh, little bit of, of background details. Okay, so if we think then about software and where we are, we can also think about why people tend to um, actually put effort into software um, and how we can engage them. And I'm gonna use, as for the rest of this talk, um, this idea that engagement we can think of as intrinsic motivation plus extrinsic motivation plus support minus friction. Um, and we want to increase the first three of these and then decrease the last one, obviously. So, uh, and I'm gonna, well, okay, I'll just mention intrinsic motivation is the motivation that's internal, extrinsic motivation is the motivation that's external, so you can think about those. Uh, support is the things that we can do to, to make this happen, and then friction is the things that are actually preventing this from happening. Okay, so having said that, then there are a series of different things that different organizations can do. Um, projects can do things, uh, for example, um, like uh, using known technology, using known licenses, using GitHub, using GitLab, things like that, as opposed to creating your own license, putting your, building your own systems. Um, you can create uh, guidelines for good pull requests, right, that help make it easier for people to, to work on your software. Um, you can uh, provide a code of conduct and be welcoming and encouraging in your projects to try to, again, encourage people and make it easier for people to join in. Uh, you can provide good first issues, again, trying to, to welcome new people, make it easy for them. Uh, you can add contributors to a list of authors, so whenever anybody contributes to your software, add them to the list of people that are being recognized as contributors immediately. Right? Don't wait until you're writing a paper two years later. Um, you can think of, uh, of highlighting examples of how the software is used, which both helps you as well as helping those other people that have used your software by highlighting their work as well. And, um, and you can ensure that your project is diverse and, and highlight the diverse elements of your project, highlight people that maybe haven't been recognized before. Um, so there's, again, a, a series of different things that, that projects can do. Um, you can think about this in some sense as a, uh, a plan of, of progression, an engagement um, progression. Uh, and, and the idea here is that um, there's a bunch of different points at which people will come into a project, and at each of those points, there are actions that you can take to help them progress to the next step. And once they progress to the next step, then there's another set of actions that you can take to help them progress to that step after that. And so these steps range from the initial contact up to potentially becoming leaders of a project over time. Um, communities have a number of things that they can do thinking about, um, about systematic change. So communities can support incentives and citation. They can support RSEs and to see this as a valid career path and to talk about this in community meetings and in, in societies. Um, they can support software work. Uh, sorry, I guess I'm, I should say that the, the letters here, as you might have guessed, are, um, are the uh, in, in, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation or support or friction. Sorry, I should have said that earlier. Um, Right, the communities can support software work through having, having prizes, having conference sessions where software is identified and, and recognized uh, by encouraging fair software, um, by communicating about the, about the community, about the software, about needs for new software, about gaps, 
and, and by encouraging collaboration, by thinking about how different communities come together and, and work on software. I think um, since Adrian's here, I'll just mention AstroPy is, is one of the really nice examples of, of a community coming together and, and building software collectively. Um, but we'd like to see examples like that in, in other places as well. Uh, funders, then, can think about systematic changes. These systematic changes include supporting incentives and supporting citation. Um, how this is done depends on the funder individually, and so I can't tell you how to do this, but I can tell you that from my point of view, it's very important that you, that you do this, and then you tell the people that are going to be applying for funding about this as well. <laughs> okay, sorry, a little bit long. Getting close to the end. Um, you can also think about this. How, how do you support RSEs when you have opportunities for funding? Um, are RSEs eligible to apply? Do you have particular calls to, 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 uh, to encourage institutions to support RSEs within their institution? Do you have um, opportunities for people to be trained to be RSEs, maybe as undergraduates? Um, can, you, can you fund more explicit software development, uh, including a path to uh, to take the projects that happen, to take the software that happens in those individual research projects and to expand them? Uh, do you require fair software as an output of projects? Um, do you require open software by default? Um, so as the, the, uh, our, our speaker from the NWO was saying, uh, open science is important, and I completely agree with that. Uh, it's not completely clear to me that open software is the one thing that we have to do all the time. I think there are reasons that closed software can be the right thing, but open software, I think, should be the default, and people should have to justify why software is not open. Um, you can require proposals to talk about sustainability. So you can say, if you are funding software, you know that you're not just putting money into this for three years, but you want this to be sustained. So how is the project going to sustain the software afterwards? All right, where are the resources going to come from? What's, the, what's going to happen? Um, you can accept that funding new software requires an obligation to fund some maintenance afterwards. Um, this might be that for every dollar that you put in, uh, sorry, for every euro that you put into to new software, uh, you put five cents into maintaining existing software. Um, and you think about that, maybe it's 10 cents. I don't know what the right number is, but, but it's not zero. Um, and then finally, you can support research in measuring the impact and improving these, these changes. We don't really know, for example, these things very well. It was very hard for me to find out how much software is being funded by different agencies, and we don't know how that's increasing or decreasing over time. So I, I would like to think that funders would be interested in this and would want to expose this to others. Um, and so this, uh, yeah, so that in, again is, is collecting and analyzing software that is being funded. Um, I'll say that there's a bunch of things institutions can do. I'm just gonna go through these, uh, I'm just gonna page through these, they're, they're overlapping. But from the point of view of institutions, they're similar to what funders do, but they have different ways of actually implement, of being implemented through, through staffing, through uh, career paths. Uh, through promotion and tenure, through other uh, promotion mechanisms. Um, the, last, the, the one thing I will say, though, is that um, I think institutions should be thinking about open source program offices in particular as an area that hasn't been very well developed within those institutions. And for institutions that have technology transfer offices, they should be thinking about the fact that the goal of those offices is to transfer technology. It's not to make money. Um, and that's, uh, I think, a problem that happens often. Okay, so I'm gonna end here, sorry for running slightly over. I'll just say that there's a lot of different people that have been involved in a lot of the different pieces uh, who I thank any of whom are here and, and those who are not here as well. Um, and I would be happy if we haven't run over too long to take any questions, so thank you. Much. Dan, is it working? The microphone. I can't hear myself. If it is, uh, yeah. So, um, well, thank you very much for this very full overview of the um, problems and some of the solutions you, met, you meet when uh, you deal with research software. It just about describes the kind of nightmarish scenario we have to deal with every day at the, at the eSign Center. It's, it's a huge problem, a very difficult one to solve. And sorry for squeezing you into this uh, one uh, half hour to um, give this very full presentation, but that does mean that you have used up your Q&A and that we um, <laughs> have to take a break now and we'll reconvene at, at quarter past. Right, so see you at, uh, in 15 minutes and talk to Dan during the break. He's here with us the two days. So thank you very much.